Dear friends joining us online, good afternoon. My name is Jingjing, moderator today. Welcome to join us on China Philanthropy Conference, Education and Poverty Elevation, launch of the China Issue Guide. On behalf of our hosts today, CDRF and CAPS, I'd like to express our gratitude to the following guests. They are Mr. Fang Jing, Secretary General, China Development Research Foundation. Mr. Ronnie Chen, co-founder and chairman of CAPS. Dr. Ruth Shabro, co-founder and chief executive of CAPS. Head of UBS Social Impact Philanthropy, Greater China, Madam Geng Ming. Mr. Yu Jiantuo, Vice Secretary General, CDRF. Ray Xi Hao, Senior Program Officer, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation. In the same time, we'd like to thank the panelists for joining us today. Li Kemei, Founder, Vice Chairman, Secretary General, De Qing Foundation. Chairwoman, Jack Ma Foundation. Yu Xiu Hong, Vivian Yuan, Secretary General, Tsinghua Foundation. Wang Jun, Vice Secretary General, China Foundation for Rural Development. Wen Wei, Vice President, Eve Group. Zeng Xiong, Vice Secretary General, Guo Qiang Foundation. Thank you all for joining us today. In addition to have experts and frontline practitioners sharing with us their insight, CAPS will also launch our latest research report, as we said in the beginning of this year, the China Issue Guide, Educational Philanthropy, and China Issue Guide from Poverty Elevation to Rural Revitalization. We will engage with the panelists in the two round tables to discuss with us on their valuable experience in education and poverty alleviation. The conference today provides simultaneous interpretation service on Zoom platform. Please select Chinese or English channel from the Zoom toolbar interpretation function. Our event today is also live streaming on Phoenix Philanthropy and Sina Microblog Philanthropy channel. Welcome to friends from there as well. Now, let's get started. First of all, please join me in welcoming Fang Jing, Secretary General, CDRF, for opening remarks. Thank you to the moderator, respected Mr. Ronnie Chen, and respected Dr. Ruth Shepherd. Good afternoon. I am very happy that CDRF joins with CAPS once again to host today's China Philanthropy Conference. Today, we will explore education and poverty alleviation, launching the China Issue Guide. And today, I am happy to see all of the friends in the philanthropic cause. On behalf of CDRF, I'd like to warmly welcome and say thank you to each and every one of you for joining us today. The philanthropy in China is booming with the donations and number of volunteers growing continuously, playing increasingly important role in China's economic and social development. We hope by engaging in the research of philanthropy in China today and on key areas, we will be able to arouse more attention and engagement from philanthropists and general public to together promote philanthropy playing a more significant role in rural revitalization, social fairness, and people's well-being. In the 20th CPC National Congress just convened in October, the government proposed a primary risk task of modernization with Chinese characteristics. This is a modernization with vast population. And in the report, the government stated the people-centric development philosophy, stating improving well-being and improving people's living quality, increasing accessibility and uh, equilibrium of public services, promoting common prosperity, wealth distribution systems, promoting competent individuals, NGOs, and enterprises to participate in charity to promote rural revitalization, poverty alleviation, providing better quality education, promoting education fairness. 
The common prosperity requires all of us to share the results and fruit of common prosperity while maintaining economic growth. So in primary distribution resources, we should pay attention to fairness and efficiency. In secondary distribution, more care to vulnerable groups. And in third time of distribution, to help out one another. That's where charity and philanthropy call in. Actually, a lot of powers in philanthropy are already engaging and making great progress. As CAP's report said, the goal of China's philanthropy is aligned with the government in China. In last 10 years, China has realized the historic mission of eradicating poverty and building a modern superpower society, realizing the first 100-year goal, in particularly in eliminating absolute poverty, lifting almost 100 million people out of poverty, building the world's largest educational system and the social security system, health system, and educational accessibility have also witnessed a great leap forward. With our research, we found that rural areas in China have witnessed tremendous changes. Ever since 2005, CDRF has compiled our China National Human Development Report, focusing on social fairness. And our goal is to also promote social fairness and common prosperity. Later, in the underdeveloped remote areas, we started out our social experiment to carry out policy research policy advocacy for children, education, and health in the remote areas. Starting from 2006, we have engaged the Nurturing China Village Early Education Platform, uh, One Kindergarten Per Village Program, the Sunshine School Breakfast Data Platform, the Informationization for Rural Children Education, Winning the Future for Secondary Vocational Schools, the uh, one kindergarten, one village program started in the year 2009, providing early year education for year three and six kids from rural areas, promoting educational fairness and quality enhancement. The project is overseen by county level educational department and supported by CDRF. Today, with the supports from all social sectors, this program covered more than 300 thousand students with gross admission rate for three-year preschool education surpassing 90 percent, even higher than national average, and many provincial government are now engaging in that program as well. Education is the most vital means of interrupting the intergenerational transmission of poverty, yet there are still urban and rural educational inequality in China. Since China's um, Last few years, the Chinese government has had three revised version for China development outlines, providing policy support for the well-being of kids in China. There is still room for policy improvement. We have made great performance. However, a lot of substantive investments still go down to town level and not yet penetrate to county level. So one feature of the report convened in uh, October is to incorporate education, technology, and talents into one independent chapter rather than in the past. So this is a key focus on rejuvenating the country through science and education, because education is part of people's well-being, but more importantly, a national policy. People care about education, and the Chinese government is also carrying education. That's why we need to provide higher quality education for kids from having access to school to having access to quality education. Providing an early year education for children, enhancing their capabilities will also help us to provide social ladders for these kids to climb upward. So CDRF is trying every day, hope that we will be able to play a bigger role for social experiment and publish policy advocacy for rural children. In 2020, we collaborated with Bijie City on a Bijie experiment on rural children development demonstration zone. In 2021 September, the demonstration zone officially started covering nutrition, early year education, care and protection, providing whole cycle experiment coverage from birth to employment. Our interventions are in intended to promote these demonstration zone as a great pioneering zone for common prosperity and rural revitalization. This year, 
we have upgraded our Children Development Center into Children Development Research Institute. And on top of that, we will continue to carry out social experiments, providing policy advocacy and focusing on whole cycle well-being and education coverage for kids from birth to employment. We believe that everyone has the opportunity to realize their own development and the right to enjoy the fruits of development. We will continue to focus on policy and academic research to children in remote area. I hope all of the institutions today will join us for these efforts and we look forward to more engagements with you in the future. I'd like to say thank you to Chairman Ronnie Chen for your commitment and support in philanthropy and our foundation. And thank you to our old friend CAPS and dear colleagues from all foundations. Thank you for your engagement and I look forward to listening to your remarks and discussion. Thank you. Thank you to Secretary General Fang Jing for that great remarks. Now, please join me in welcoming Ronnie Chen, the co-founder and chairman CAPS to give us remarks. Great pleasure to join Secretary General Fang Jing from CDRF on today's China Philanthropy Conference. Today, we are launching the China Issue Guide series. As the co-founder and chairman of CAPS, I sincerely welcome all of you. Dr. Ruth Superior, about 10 years ago, we started CAPS and it is our greatest honor to be able to have the opportunity to work with CDRF. I also would love to thank UBS for supporting our China Issue Guide on Education Philanthropy, as well as Bill Melinda Gates Foundation for their support to our China Issue Guide series on poverty alleviation. CAPS spent two years for evidence-based research in four areas, health, environment, which we have already launched. And today we're launching the China Issue Guide series on education philanthropy and the poverty alleviation to rural revitalization. We all know that philanthropy in China is a emerging sector with great potential and vitality. About 10 plus years ago, I told a lot of my foreign friends that um, it is important for them to look at philanthropy and philanthropic donations in China because the Chinese businessmen are very socially responsible and when they accumulate wealth, they'll have great practice in means of philanthropic. Which is different from other countries. And in Asia, there are some fundamental features of philanthropy that differs in East and in West. Not only in China, I'm talking about Asia at large. Here, we engage in philanthropy just like the government and our directions are aligned with the goal of government. That's a feature of Asian philanthropy and the philanthropy with Chinese characteristics. That's why the China Issue Guide series research have been mapping the landscape of philanthropy, especially in two areas of education philanthropy and poverty alleviation. What have we done? What are the accomplishments? And what are the unmet issues and demands? And I believe the issue guide will be of great um, information for all of you. In preparing for these reports, I have had the honor of visiting many leading philanthropists in China, like Mr. Wang Shi, Mr. Ai Lu Ming, and uh, Mr. Chen Yi Dan. And they are great philanthropists who have started philanthropy in China ahead of other countries. We also have visited many foundations management which have given us great inspiration. So I think that is a great platform 
and a great report. So I look forward to joining with all of you to continue our efforts in philanthropic development in China. And we continue to look forward to collaborating with CDRF under the leadership of Mr. Fang Jing, Secretary General. I'm so happy that we've been working since day one with CDRF. And I'm happy to know that with the previous uh, secretary retired, Mr. Fang has taken up the leadership of CDRF and we are happy about this for CDRF and uh, we hope that we can continue to work together in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ronnie, for your fantastic speech. We are moving on to the announcement of the uh, China issue guide announcement and to continue to improve the quality and quantity of the philanthropic endeavor in China. And we are also trying to boost an environment for the different philanthropy endeavors in the field of education and poverty alleviation and so on and so forth. We have conducted a number of research on philanthropy and in this February, we have announced the Healthcare China Guide. And I'm gonna now invite the CAPS co-founder, chief executive, Dr. Ruth Shapiro to give us a report on the philanthropy with Chinese characteristics. It's gonna be in English and please choose the translations function from Zoom. Let's welcome Dr. Shapiro. Ching ni men yong nega jung wen de di fang, so yi wo ku yi shua ing wen. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. It is my great um, privilege to be able to share our findings with you. First, let me thank our chairman, Ronnie Chan, for his um, tireless efforts on our behalf. Let me also thank our wonderful partner, CDRF, and in particular, Fang Jin, and our great friend and partner, Yu Jianto, who you will hear from later in this program. We also want to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and UBS for their support, not only for the China Issue Guide series, but for all of our work in China and around Asia. And lastly, I want to thank all the people who gave their time and thoughts to our interviews, and uh, many of them are on the panel discussions later, so I will let you hear from them yourselves. It's not going. Okay. We know that philanthropy is growing in China. And prior to COVID, the pandemic, philanthropic donations of more than 1 million RMB um, amounted to 27.63 billion RMB, a 50 fold increase from the year before and almost a four fold increase from a decade ago. Now, the last few years, have been strange for everyone. Um, so we don't have statistics from them, but most certainly we know that philanthropy and the notion of giving back is strong in China. And these numbers will certainly be surpassed in the coming months and years. Um, but, you know, we wanted to go beyond these numbers. And we wanted to go beyond the lists of who's giving the most amount. We wanted to understand what is philanthropy with Chinese characteristics? How is the money spent? What kinds of projects are being supported? And why? And where? And by who? So our China Issue Guides really go deep into the project level data to tell us what is philanthropy with China characteristics. And I'm going to share some of our findings this afternoon. First, we know that the 
there, the number of foundations, Ji Jin Hui, is growing. But the term Ji Jin Hui is a little bit confusing for those outside of China because it really refers to five different types of organizations. You can see systemic, corporate, school, community, and, and where's the other one? Um, an individual, sorry. Um, some of these make grants, which is similar to the word foundation outside of China, but some of these are operating foundations. They may even receive grants from others. We also know that systemic are growing the fastest. Those are foundations that really focus on a particular locality, even down to the municipal level. If you look at the bottom chart, you can see that the amount of money that's going out. And what's interesting to note here is that the rate of growth of foundations is actually higher than the rate of growth for the money that's being dispersed. That's good news because it means that China is professionalizing the sector. These foundations hire talent who understand how to, how to make a philanthropic project, how to be impactful, how to think of over the long term for the greatest scale and impact. And we need that kind of talent. That talent base is growing very much in China with the growth of these separate foundations. Now let's just turn to education, which is one of our two areas. Um, Many of you who are listening today may know that when foundations in China give their reports to the government, they need to tag their projects. They need to identify the project. Is this a health project? Is this an education project? And it is not surprising to see that almost half of all projects are education. Um, so you can see on the, on the left-hand side, 48.42% of all projects go to education. In fact, education is near and dear to the cultural and kind of historical traditions in China. Um, we also see that education is the largest when it comes to the amount of money. The chart on the left is the number of projects. The chart on the right is how much money is spent. And still education makes up one third of, of, the, of the actual money being deployed. So let's just look at the kind of projects that are being done in the field of education. You can see that higher education accounts for half. This is funding going to universities and we have a really important speaker from Tsinghua Dashui later on, who's gonna tell us about the work that she's doing in terms of receiving and deploying the donations that she receives at Tsinghua. One of the interesting things that really differentiates Chinese philanthropy from those in other countries is in the field of higher education. In most other countries, people only give to their alma maters. They give to the schools that they attended. But in China, this is not the case. You often have people who give to eight, 10, 12 universities, regardless of whether they attended those universities or not. This is in line with the government wanting to build up China as an education powerhouse in the world. So there's a lot of funding going to building up the, the quality and services provided at the tertiary level. You can also see that the second largest group is compulsory education. That is primary and secondary. What's, what's missing or small is higher education. And this actually is one of the challenges. It helps if you don't fund higher education, many students stop going, they don't go on to university, and it helps contribute to what some people fear is a middle income trap. Um, 
In our studies, in addition to looking how the money is spent, we look at the gaps where there where philanthropic capital can make more of an impact going forward. And we're gonna share some of those areas with you later, but certainly high school education is one such area that warrants more investment. So what do we find as characteristics of education philanthropy? Well, um, Education, as I said earlier, is a key part of the Chinese value system and tradition. Funding for education goes back thousands of years, and it is the go-to topic or issue when people have some income that they want to give out, often in the form of scholarships, but not only. We also know there's a tendency to support areas based on personal experiences, interests, or connectivity. You know, in education, everyone is an expert because we all went to school and we think we understand the education system. That's unlike environment where you need scientific understanding to really create a viable environmental project. In education, we know what we like, we know what works, and we know what we think is important. What we're gonna hear today from some of our speakers is how their personal experience, their passions, their thoughts contributed to the type of projects that they do. We also know that university donations, as I mentioned earlier, are aligned with government priorities and provide multiple benefits for the donors. In some ways, giving to top universities is no risk. We donors feel justifiably so that by giving to Tsinghua or Beida or Fudan, their money will be well spent. And there's reasons to be, to understand why they have that confidence. We, in education projects tend to be multifaceted. And what do I mean by that? That means that people are providing for a school. They're also providing scholarships. They're also helping to build out the school, so it may be infrastructure. They're providing for teacher training so that each education project has various components to allow the whole project to succeed. It's not surgical so much as comprehensive and synergistic. And lastly, for the corporate foundations, we see shared value or win-win strategies and we'll explain some of those when we go into some projects. So as I said, we wanna give you some examples and the panels will go into greater detail in other examples. But here are four areas that we'd like to point to that warrant consideration and could actually benefit from additional support. The first is vocational education. And here is a natural area for corporate foundations to be involved to cre help create skilled workers, many of which will then be employed by the same foundation. Country Garden is such an example. They funded the Guangdong Country, Country Garden Polytechnic, which is a vocational school. And it provides 100% free tuition for those, those kids who need it, poor kids from poor areas. They have a 100% employment rate after those kids graduate from this, from, the, the, from this school, which is terrific. Actually, people with vocational training are in demand in China, as you all know. The second project I'd like to tell you about is, from, is, is funded by the Hupan Modu, Ji Jinhui, and this is a group of women who are working moms themselves. They, um, they all worked at Alibaba and they created this foundation and they created a project called Parenting for the Future. And this project works with parents to help them understand how to teach 21st century skills to their children, how to help their children succeed in school and in life. 
In 2018 and 2019, the, the foundation funded 25 centers with 30,000 beneficiaries. In China, it's easy to get to scale because everything that happens often happens in a big way. So that's very encouraging and a lesson for the rest of the world. The next project is called All Round Development. And that's really to help young people. Yes, it's important to learn reading and writing, but it's also important to be a well-rounded citizen. And the Chinese government and Chinese schools understand that. This project works in um, elementary and secondary schools to teach Chinese youth and the teachers who are teaching them how to write poetry, how to appreciate poetry, how to listen to poetry. And so far they are working in 1200 primary and secondary schools. Poetry is also something that is ingrained in Chinese culture and tradition. And we are delighted to see a project that's really reaching back to a core strength of what makes China really an enlightened cultured um, country and society. And lastly, I wanna talk about special education. This is really education for disabled, both physically and mentally disabled children. This is an area that receives far too little support. So the example we have here is funded by the Kadori Family Foundation, which is actually a Hong Kong based um, foundation. And they help schools take in disabled children and embed them into the general population. They give the teachers more training and they provide special facilities so that the disabled children can thrive. Let's go on to the next topic, which is rural alleviation, poverty alleviation and rural revitalization. Now, I don't think it's the news flash for anyone on this, listening to this webinar, that China had a poverty alleviation campaign from 2015 to 2020, the end of which there was success declared that absolute poverty had been totally alleviated in China. I can tell you that as we at CAPS travel around Asia, everybody wants to know how this was done. It's never been done before. It's an extraordinary achievement, but we can't just rest on our laurels. We can't just say we've done it. Now comes the hard work of making sure that those poverty alleviation efforts are institutionalized. And that's why the government created the rural revitalization scheme to kind of bring us to the next level and create the institutions and structures that keep these people who have newly gotten out of poverty to, to allow them to stay out of poverty. For this particular aspect, our poverty alleviation work, um, we were greatly helped by Yu Jianto at CDRF. So, um, um, so let's look at what has been funded. First, similar to education, we can see the self-identified focus areas for poverty, and we can see that it's number three. Now, this data comes during the five-year period of the poverty alleviation campaign. So it's not surprising that there was an important focus on poverty. Um, and we can also see that the amount of funding is um, also number three on the right-hand side. But I just wanna make a note here. When you tell the government what a project is, you can only pick one tab. You can say this is a poverty project, or this is an education project, or this is a healthcare project. But poverty is almost, well, always aligned with something else. So you, it is an education project or a healthcare project. So these numbers are vast underestimation. In fact, 
when we use the word fuping and other words associated with poverty, one third of all projects tend to be poverty related. Once again, this data comes from the time in which the poverty alleviation campaign was going on. So that is not surprising. What kinds of projects were supported during this time? And we can see where the money went. Infrastructure accounts for the largest chunk. And by infrastructure, we mean building schools, bridges, hospitals, roads, water systems, particularly in the 832 counties that were designated by the government as the top destination for the poverty alleviation work. The second biggest area is actually financial assistance. And this was cash donations to get people across the line. And as I said, that is why it's so important to focus now on rural revitalization because you, you don't wanna keep giving cash donations. You want people to become self-sufficient. The third area, the third and fourth is income generating, helping to provide livelihoods and jobs and ongoing income. And of course, education, which helps with poverty a great extent. So what do we know about poverty alleviation? Well, here are our top findings. One, the government of China has been hugely successful in bringing together all the resources and coordinating them so that they can achieve the goal of alleviating absolute poverty. When I'm in other countries, I often use the metaphor that in some ways, the poverty alleviation effort was like a giant orchestra and the government gave the music and they are the conductor and they were able to make sure that the violins played and the oboes played and the cellos played so that you ended up with a beautiful set of music that was the, absolute, the, the alleviation of absolute poverty. Second, like education, most projects are multifaceted and are based on the needs and resources of the community. What happened in China is that assessments were made in the poor areas. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What kinds of industries can best be supported and how can we support them? What kind of education do they need? And those kinds of assessments were integral in being able to create this, bring about this incredible achievement. Third, efforts are made to equip people with skills. The government is really cognizant that they don't want a group of people that are dependent on hands out handouts. They want to create ongoing livelihoods and empowerment. And so helping people to have the skills, to have the knowledge, to have the education, to, do, to create their own livelihoods was integral to the success and still is. And the last is the notion of what I was just saying, stimulating aspiration of impoverished people to really get poor people on board with being the solutions to their own problems, helping them have a sense of agency, of empowerment, that they can be part of the solution and must be part of the solution. We have some examples of the types of projects we're talking about here. The first is the charity house. What that is, is um, it's, it's actually a really neat project where these charity houses were set up um, in poor areas to train people to take care of other poor people who have more difficult challenges than they have. So poor people without disabilities were trained to take care of and help poor people with disabilities. So this is really a, a virtuous circle which allows people to take care of each other um, and in these charity houses, which are now, there's 14 of them in poor areas. The second project was done by Alibaba. And in that, the, 
Alibaba realized that there are many, many local agricultural products that are not being put into the national supply chain or the certainly the global supply chain. So what they did is they worked with local government units to identify these agricultural products. In fact, they identified 2,532 of them. Um, help those farmers and those communities bring up the quality of those products so that they could go on the Taobao and other types of sites and be put into the supply chain, bringing about, obviously, sustainable income. The next project is called Mother's Water Cellar. And what that is, that project has provided, continues to provide safe drinking water to 3.24 million poor, poor people in the poor communities. Certainly, if water is not clean, you get sick. And if you're sick, you cannot take care of yourself. And so clean drinking water is integral to being having rural revitalization, poverty alleviation and rural revitalization. And last, we have an example of local support where my Maine and One Health provides free health checkups for poor working moms in poor areas. So often, and I'm a working mom, they tend to put the needs of their family first and not think of themselves until sometimes they're too sick. So Maine Ann is making it easy for these working moms to be able to take care of their own health needs. In our China issue guide, it's meant to be a guide to help people really understand what's possible for them. How can they help? What can they do? And at the back of the, of the China issue guide, we show if you don't have a foundation, what can you do? You can donate to a social delivery organization. That can be an NGO or, um, or a nonprofit of some sort or you can give to a gongo, a government operated non-governmental organization. If you have a foundation, you can develop in-house interventions. And what we have found throughout this study is that wealthy people who start foundations, and this is certainly true with the women from Alibaba, have expertise and understanding that they bring to bear in designing projects that are much more likely to be sustainable and impactful because they're bringing that understanding and that business rigor with them. That is true for family foundations, and it's certainly true for corporate foundations that have a lot of technical skills and understanding. They can be involved in CSR and shared value. What is important to realize is there's a spectrum of financing. And you can see that on one side is philanthropy where there's no return at all. And on the other side is commercial investment where you're hoping to make the largest return possible. Well, there's a lot in the middle, venture philanthropy, impact investment, and socially responsible investment. In fact, in this middle area, there's a proliferation of innovations happening in China and around the world that make that essentially bring business thinking, business tools to solve social problems. You can download our studies from our website and from our WeChat account. I think here's the QR codes. I also encourage any, because there's not a Q&A session for today, if you have questions or comments, please write to me. Ruth at caps.org. I would be very happy to hear from you um, in English or in Chinese. I have a very capable colleague, um, Anchi Chang, who is our go to person in China, who has been integral in helping to make this China issue guide come alive and be and 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 allow us to finish it in the first place. So please send us questions. Please engage with us. 
just because we're finished with this particular project, we look forward to doing a lot more in China and we want to do it with you. So thank you again. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ruth Shapiro. And the China Issue Guide Series chapter on education is now announced. Congratulations. In this report, you can scan the QR code on the screen to download the report, or you can also access the website of CAPS to get the report. I believe with all the contribution of the philanthropist will continue to help us to grow this industry and endeavor for philanthropy. And now we're gonna kick off the panel discussion for today. And in case you have any, any questions, please uh, leave your questions on Zoom. We will collect them and then send them to the moderators of the panel. Education philanthropy is one of the top priorities of philanthropic endeavor. We have invited the UBS social impact, Madam Geng Ming for Greater China. And she will be the moderator of the panel. And we are also going to invite from the Qing Foundation, Madam Li Kemei, also from Jack Ma Foundation, Madam Yu Xiu Hong from Tsinghua University Education Foundation, Madam Yuan Wei. And they will be the panelists of the panel of education. Madam Gong, please, you will be the moderator. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. The SDG 17 of UN number four is about education goal for inclusive and uh, fair quality education for the people so they can have access to education. Supporting the education for the younger generation is the top priority of UBS. They, in this APS, uh, each China issue get, China has already built up the largest education system in China, in the world and the scale and complexity of Chinese education means that will be also gaps and unsatisfied needs. And we will ask all the leaders from different organizations to share with us the need of education that you have discovered. Starting from Man Lee, please. Speaking of the positioning of the organizations, I think there are three factors. Firstly, you need to look at the national or policies. And secondly, you need to look at the world to understand the market need and the unmet need. And thirdly, based on your own resources and capabilities. So 2014 and 2013 are the starting years of the De Qing Foundation. We are trying to support the education in our homeland, supporting the students and also provide prize money for the teachers. And President Xi mentioned the precision poverty abbreviation for those who cannot attend the, the schools are now covered by the government initiatives. And then we have transferred our effort to quality education for younger generation. And we, based on our observation and based on our conversation with the local education organizations and teachers and the students, we find out the aesthetic education in rural area is a weak link. In 2013, we started to work on the uh, training activities for the primary and secondary schools. And in 2015, we have started our choir uh, program for the students. The vision is to make sure the students in the rural area can always access high quality music education. The slogan is to use the voice to enlighten the heart. And currently in the background of uh, rural area revitalization, we are continuing to focus on this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Lee. At Jack Ma Foundation, we are registered by the end of 2014. Starting from 2015, we established our strategy about uh, education philanthropy. And we have a lot of works in the education field. I'm focusing on the rural education initiatives. Like we said earlier, as a 
a philanthropic organization, we need to look at the need of the society. We also want to find out where we can uh, kick in to solve some problems we have discovered. In 2015, we are starting to focus on the rural education and we did some market survey and we looked into the reports and we did interviews in the field. So in the countryside education, I think it's a very complicated system. Many society issues is based on a complex system. There are many perspectives you can choose. And so we look at the stakeholders and we are trying to break down the mission. Speaking of education, the beneficiaries are, we need to know that who would be our beneficiaries or the customers of the foundations. And of course, they are going to be the students and kids in the countryside. So Jack Ma used to be a teacher and he has his uh, personal affections for education in the countryside. We want to support the children. We want them to be better. And how can we help the students in the countryside? And we are supporting them through our strategies. And we know that for the children, the development is actually including the education they get in the school and also in the, at home and down the society. And home education is most important. However, we cannot uh, deal with each individual families, especially in the countryside. The parents are actually working in the city. They are away from home. And we need to look at the real need. And we also need to look, understand our resources, whether we have the capability to deal with the needs. So we are trying to focus on the education atmosphere in the school. So the home education, school education, and the society education have been analyzed. And then we try to focus on school environment for the education endeavor. And inside the school, despite that our strategies and the systems have macro impact on the students. However, the teachers are more important to give impact to the students and the atmosphere is also very important. That's why in our program, we have a few series, uh, countryside teachers, headmasters and boarding schools. And these are the three projects we had. And that's based on the requirements we have discovered in the countryside. And in this process, I think I can give you one example for the countryside teacher, for instance. The, once we have identified the, them, we are trying to dig deeper to understand for the teachers in the countryside, what are their uh, requirements and needs? And we find out in our survey that in the year of 2015, of course, that's almost 10 years ago, the environment has changed. However, at the time, we discovered that uh, the challenge for the countryside student, uh, countryside teachers are that they have very low income. And some of them are not in the uh, uh, headcount system. They are making uh, living paycheck to paycheck, and they don't have uh, potential to develop their career. And many of them don't want to go to the countryside. And when they spend two, three years in the countryside, they will be lagged behind compared with uh, their uh, college classmates who worked in the city. So they sometimes they want to contribute. However, they uh, will be lagged behind after th two or three years in the countryside. And the third challenge is that uh, they don't get recognized from the society, including their families and friends. And what they do are not appreciated sometimes. And I remember I saw a report, the cover was really impressive. And they said the countryside teachers are marginalized workers. It's more like sometimes the workers in the factory can make more money than the countryside teacher. 
and the, however, they are intellectuals, they don't make money, they don't have uh, development uh, potential for the career, and they don't get recognition. That's why the turnover is very high, and many of the good teachers don't want to stay in the countryside. And that's why in the designing of our project, we are trying to uh, identify those issues. Okay, that's going to conclude my uh, sharing for now. Now, Madam Yuan, please. Thank you, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here on this forum. At Tsinghua Education Foundation, we are in a different position than the previous two foundations. They are providing supporting services, and we are like a connector between universities and the, the society. We raise money, and we get donations from the philanthropist. On the other side, we use the money for university development. The MC has asked about the need and uh, uh, requirements in education. So I, when I was the uh, foundation secretary, I had the same question. Why a university like Tsinghua would need some money? However, I think for Tsinghua University, they also need money. And you can see the fiscal budget of Tsinghua is already very huge, as you can see from the public sources. And the, in the budget of Tsinghua, only 20, 30% are coming from the fiscal budget. Most of the money are coming from the uh, internally raised sources. And a major part is coming from the uh, private sector or donation. And for a country to develop universities, you must have a number of top universities, not just the one or two universities. For the top universities and the innovation they're trying to discover, the science discoveries, when they are trying to break through the barriers between disciplines, for those endeavors, they are trying to encourage the students and uh, teachers. Those endeavors are very hard to be supported by the fiscal budget and that where you need um, some fund from the society. And that's the need for education. And for our foundation, we have, have the a number of things, four plus one. I think we have master uh, resources. Master means to support all the students and including the fellows of uh, Ch Chinese Academy of S uh, Science or Engineering. We also have international uh, scientists who have come from Ch other countries. We are also educating other teachers. And fiscal budget is not enough. And if you look at the salary and the funding, they're always uh, in short. And we are supporting the uh, teachers. And I think I will share with you more in the later. And second one is the, the for talents. That means for the students, we have scholarship uh, assistance. We also have fellowship supporting the students to have uh, internship around the world, sometimes inside China. We also have entrepreneurship for them sometimes. We also have other programs with tutors for the students so we can support them. And third one is for science research project. And we are looking into the uh, cutting edge science discoveries. Sometimes they're away from the market practice to support those students and scientists, I think I will give you some more examples later. And the fourth one is about infrastructure, the buildings, laboratories, equipment. We have got a lot of uh, uh, support from the society. And finally, about the social service. That's similar to what has been shared, but the other foundations, and we have also property alleviation practice. 
and I think in education, I think we need a lot of support from different parts of the society. Thank you. Thank you. Great sharings from all of our speakers. And just to echo what Dr. Ruth Shapiro said, we've seen very diverse foundations in their very innovative practice. They have philanthropic project in line with their interest, their attention, and their strategic position. And they really mobilize resources to realize their philanthropic goal. Great sharing, thank you. In the interest of time, we'll just move on to the second question. Uh, just now, the three speakers have shared with us, we learned from them that uh, given the complexity of uh, educational needs, there's a great demand for educational programs. To realize quality education for each and everyone, we're still not there yet, so it requires the continuous efforts from more institutions and uh, philanthropists. We all know that philanthropy is a great force moving forward the development of education. So my second question is, can you please share a signature or innovative solution in line with your past practice? Thank you. Okay, I'll go first. You, you know, we're living in a new era and one feature of the new era is Internet Plus. For charity or philanthropy organizations, we also need to evolve with technology. We have established Midodo philanthropic live stream booths. And just as you see from my backdrop, this live streaming booth is a great platform to provide class training, and class live streaming. For example, recently we've engaged with Zhejiang Academy of Music, School of Musical Education. We have joined the resources from the well-known musical teachers. We have tailor-made the program covering teachers' training, students' presentation, and students' training. In order to ensure the efficiency of such live stream, we use live stream teaching plus offline management, where we work with the county level and town level educational bureau. We ask the teachers to sign when they come into our classroom we encourage them and provide them incentives. And actually, this has been quite fruitful. Our live streaming classes also has aroused the interest of college students and music lovers. To some extent, these great calls have promoted the charitable efforts as well as wider engagement. We also have Tsai Hua Chong Choral Singing Festival, where we work with three kindergartens to share and participate in chorus singing by Mi Duo Duo charitable live streaming platform. We also join forces with Tencent Xiaohonghua platform. We have live streamed the Scene Festival. Altogether, we have attracted 160,000 audiences. This is a great festival that we have breaked the geographical boundary. Just like what Mr. Liang Suming hoped, a school has become a highland of culture in the local village, becoming a propeller for rural revitalization. Thank you, thank you. Great, great project. Well, 
As I said, we at Jack Ma Foundation identified the issues existing in countryside education today. We have several principles. One principle required by Jack Ma is the result-oriented and transparency and efficiency. Transparency is one of the key for philanthropic organizations. So in each of our projects, we want to embody these principles. And when we engage in project, when we decide the direction, we decide what are the musts and what are must nots. And for each project, we wanted to create that project into a demonstration pilot. As a philanthropic organization or a foundation, we have limited resources and we can never dream of solving all problems with one project. So when we position one project, we position that project as a demonstration project with the right methodology. And then we reflect upon on the project model for scaling up. For example, when we designed the headmaster plan, we noted that the teachers, they need to improve their methodology, but also a headmaster has great impact on one particular school. In our survey, we found, given the existing mechanism, a lot of headmasters were promoted from previously being teachers. As headmaster, they are manager, they are an executive, and the job responsibility for a headmaster differs from that of a teacher. As executives, we all know that to organize one particular organization is very different than in engage in one project. So in our survey, we found out that the dissatisfactions of the countryside teachers not only come from their low income, um, their low social status, but also from the way their headmaster manage them. So in second year after establishment, Jack Ma Foundation paid attention to the headmaster's enhancement program. In designing the project, we incorporated the principle of uh, transparency, efficiency, and each year we selected top 20 headmasters and we make them the role models. In our three-year project, we continuously to fund these headmasters um, as allowance. On top of that, we also provide enabling training, for example, tours and headmasters committee where we provide one-on-one -on -one training and mentorship to these headmasters because in practice they learn more. So it's a three-year leadership action plan learning program. And lastly, when we have improved the awareness and competence of these headmasters, um, we not necessarily see successful headmasters because we are results oriented. So we then evaluate these headmasters. We gave them 300,000 yuan as subsidy so that these headmasters will be able to create a locally viable uh, practice. And we also scale some good practices up. This year, just the last week, we have concluded our selection. We selected top 20 from over 800 headmasters. And in three years of empowerment program, um, we achieved great results. There's one headmaster from Zhejiang whose school had been visited by Minister Chen Baochen from Ministry of Education. Um, and we even have incubated very, very insightful and successful headmasters with great impact. And we also collaborate with local educational bureau on creating the studio of a well-known headmaster. Um, now, I also want to touch upon on the principle of transparency. Transparency is very important. We just serve as a platform, but we collaborate with media and we synergize with everybody in the industry. We work with professional HR agencies on developing professional selection standard to make sure the role models we have selected are truly headmasters rather than headmasters liked by the foundation. 
So the people working in the foundation are not allowed to serve as jury members. So um, this really makes sure that um, we are neutral and we rely on professional organizations to help us select the top headmasters. That also has increased the transparency and accountability of our program. As I said before, we have one particular headmaster. Each headmaster will receive about a, um, half a million allowance or subsidy. And we spend money on them in the hope that they will be of a great role model and they would amplify the fund. So only the best headmasters who knows education will be able to create the best project with our support. So these are some principles that we embodied when we engage in project. Thank you to Madame Yu. Now over to you, Vivian Yuan. Thank you. As I recall what Dr. Ruth Shapiro has mentioned, um, a lot of philanthropists would love to donate to top universities and their associated foundation because they know these foundations from top universities will have the money well spent. So we're very honored in Tsinghua Foundation, when we manage the donation, we want to be professional, compliant, and scientific. Let me give you a few example. In 2020, just as the outbreak of COVID-19, President Xi visited Tsinghua University. After the visit, Party Secretary Xi talked about two measures to curb COVID-19. One is to develop our own vaccine and second, to develop the right medicine. That was three years ago. So in the second day after President Xi's visit, our foundation has initiated a spring breeze plan. In the spring breeze plan, we set upon some foundations fund 20 million to found a spring breeze program. In the same time, we want to raise social capital and we have raised about 100 million in the Spring Breeze project. And when we manage the project, we also have an innovative practice where we rolled out a university level project open to our faculty members and students. So not only the medications uh, but also medical device for COVID-19 or associated um, solutions. In last three years, we have supported the hundreds of uh, projects with minimum investment in the beginning. These projects in the process of development also received tremendous support from the government and social sector. So if you look at the new shit of this project to the final commercialization, you would see these Spring Breeze program have been a great result. Thirdly, we received the equity donation from VANC. And in the meantime, in 2020, Tsinghua University established the Tsinghua University and VANC School of uh, Public Health. And that school had been purely funded by the equity donation from VANC. In the overall equity donation and how to manage the equity using equity to support the development of a school public health means we need to overcome a lot of technical difficulties. Also, 
last year, we have uh, a particular program on a faculty member for the lecturing professor. Last year, we have raised the lecturing professor funding for carbon neutrality, which means when the donor has donated, we kept the premium and then we made investment out of the premium. And with the return from the investment, we provide continuous support to these programs. That means a foundation like such has to be professional, capable of professional investment management capability. And in the process of the selection, we also have compliantly designed the selection process. So our foundation serves as the founder where we entrust the university to be the practitioner, where University of uh, Tsinghua, they carry out the whole project under our supervision. In terms of uh, scholarship, we also have some innovative practice. For example, Lenovo supported Tsinghua Foundation in creating a subsidy for students. For example, there has been 10 years since we rolled out this program and over the last 10 years course, we supported the impoverished um, and underdeveloped um, areas college students to better study at Tsinghua University and even engage in international communication. So from the perspective of Tsinghua Foundation, over the years, we tried our best to create innovative scientific project that is compliant to make sure every penny is well spent. Okay, thank you. I've heard uh, fantastic speeches and the sharings from three madam. It's really a intriguing. And your foundations are leading foundations in different sectors and in your sharing, whatever we do in terms of the uh, solutions and innovations, we always hope that our students and kids can be uh, fully involved. And we hope that we can get support from the government and from other organizations. And uh, uh, result orientation, professionalism are all very important keywords you have shared it, and they are very inspiring. And so far, globally, we have noticed new innovative means. For instance, uh, so collective impact program or, or uh, collaborative uh, philanthropy as well. And we are doing something ourselves, but we hope that we can also work with others. For those who can see the same kind of gaps and challenges, and we want to work together to really establish long-term uh, sustaining programs in this field. So I want to ask you, what have you have discovered in your own field? And, and uh, we want to know the focus area of the three foundations. And uh, at UPS Foundation, we are focusing on the children education, in, especially in countryside. And we, that, we hope that we can really create some synergy here. And that's where we want to hear from you. Please. So I think uh, you're talking about uh, cooperation. Yes. So in my foundation, we are working on the chorus education for the primary and secondary school in rural area. The social pain point is that the education of music is really missing in countryside of China. We have a system solution for that. 
it's like a very long chain of actions. We are trying to attract resources from every trade of the world. And in this chain, we are trying to design some nodes in this chain so we can open up and attract more resources, organizations, and the volunteers where we can co-create the projects and advance it. And so we can be more focused and making it more effective. For instance, we have one foundation as our partner. We also have a Barsha Foundation. We also have Xinhui Xing, a philanthropic organizations. We also have universities and conductors, professional uh, music educators working with us. And through these openness, we are attracting social resources onto our platform. So that, that is what we have been trying to do in the first place by designing this system from day one. Thank you, Madam Lee. Very good. Madam Yu, please. Speaking of uh, cooperation, I think it's very important. For foundations, we need to have uh, fellow partners. And that's how we started our foundation. In all of our countryside uh, education programs, we always have partners. And based on the specific characteristics of the project, we have different means in working with the partners. To give you two examples, for instance, there's a project called boarding school program in countryside. And in addition to designing the project, we always want to create a platform like Jack Ma said, and philanthropy is an endeavor of everyone. We want to create synergy, pulling all the resources from different parties. And working in the counties, I think it's mostly effective based on our research. So we are working with the Bureau of Education in those counties. For instance, in those 10 counties we worked, we know that uh, the, there are policies from the Bureau and there are uh, program and frameworks from the Bureau of Education in each of the provinces of China. However, there will be budget plan from the education agency in the counties. And this is a, a capital intensive project. So the Bureau of Education is actually helping us to coordinate and design the resources needed for this program. And we have some pilot program in the student, uh, in the schools and uh, they give us advices and the, we are also recruiting professionals to give advices and the resources from the county government will also be provided and we are actually providing a professional support including the uh, financial support and in this project i think the leading party is very important the bureau of education is responsible for planning and they are also taking lead of, of the implementation and evaluation and in this process we work with many professional agencies businesses. Sometimes the businesses are also providing resources for education, for music, sports, aesthetics, for instance, and they are also domain experts. And in this cooperation, we need to look at the characteristics of the projects. And we know that the student schools and headmasters have huge influence. However, we have tens of thousands of schools around the country. And it's not going to be enough for us to work alone. That's why we have uh, new projects going on. Um, it's like an extension of the previous program. We work with the Ministry of Education. We have a normal uh, school coordination program. And for the countryside, you, you want to enhance the existing teachers. However, you also want to recruit uh, fresh blood so they can work in the countryside. And we are working with normal universities. We are funding Hangzhou University, normal Lhasa, 
medical uh, school. And those projects have went very well inside the schools and colleges. However, we want to expand that impact. And this year, uh, uh, we are taking the opportunity of the 14th five-year plan in the education ministry. And we worked with the uh, teachers bureau to have this program called one plus M plus N. We have 10 top normal universities in China, including Beijing and the uh, Huadong the normal universities. And we have 10 groups from those 10 universities. And M means for each province, they would select the best normal university in that province. So we have 32 provincial normal universities. N means the Western part of China. We have local universities, the other 32 normal universities. So one plus uh, one uh, top university, three provincial uh, universities, and uh, then the local colleges. So they work together to help each other. We are trying to support the regional normal colleges because those students will go to the countryside because the Beijing University students will not go to the countryside as a teacher. And the Ministry of Education is playing a very important role as the planner. And they have a project steering committee. And so the foundation is working with the uh, teachers bureau from the Ministry of Education to design the project. Um, okay, we have only two minutes left. And I think, uh, I know you have a lot to share with us. Thank you very much. Okay. Madam, you, you can continue. So I think importantly, we need to work with the government agencies at different levels. Okay, that's the key point I want to share. Thank you. So for the interest of time, Madam Yuan, please. In responding to this question, I guess I just got a question. I think you can respond to that as well, very briefly. It is a question from our audience talking about the overseas donors. What are the regulations? I think there are many rules and policies for don donation. So in case they want to donate to a primary school in the rural area of China, I think that rule will be different. Okay, I will talk about the cooperation first of all. The Tsinghua Foundation, many of our projects are conducted through cooperation. I think all of our projects are through partnership. There are typical ones. In, for instance, we have a countryside revitalization workstation. In the, inside China, we have established 18 stations in 14 provinces. All the stations are done through partnership with the local foundations, sometimes local businesses, state-owned companies, MNCs and private companies. And we have established those workstations. Those are the physical organizations so they can help the local area for revitalization. And it is also a workstation for the internship of the students at Tsinghua University. And every year we have students going to those working stations providing services. We also have other examples for instance, when we do uh, investigations, we always want, want to work with the stakeholders, especially on the notion of the tertiary distribution. When the world of uh, common wealth and tertiary distribution have been mentioned, I think there are discrepancies in understandings. And I think uh, we as organizations we need to do something because at Tsinghua University, we have capabilities in research. And uh, then we work with the donors, uh, entrepreneurs to really define what is the tertiary distribution. And uh, we analyze the social impact and we analyze the behaviors inside of it. So working with the businesses and organizations, 
the partnership is really multifaceted, and that includes uh, capital investment, and they provide uh, financial support. And uh, secondly, it is also research oriented. We are pushing those theories and policy uh, uh, launches through the partnership. And you, in your question, talking about the donation over from overseas, that's also a very interesting topic. There is a process for that, and I want to brief, briefly talk about this. We just received a endowment from overseas donors. It's highly complicated. You need uh, approval from a foreign exchange. Uh, we also get need to get approval from the Ministry of Education and the Civil Affairs. Normally, in it's cash uh, donation from overseas. However, and in our own internal process, we need to have a due diligence of the donors from overseas. And then, then you need to go to the Public Security Bureau for registration, during which you need to provide a number of documents so the process, you need you need a registration. That's most important in the process with the Public Security Bureau. That's the directing uh, donation. And then speaking of the countryside support, I didn't understand your question. You, I mean, the process for a rural school would be different. I guess it's going to be different. And thank you anyway. Thank you. Thank you to all three panelists for that very insightful sharing. I totally sensed your experience, your practice, and um, your thoughts. And I look forward to more opportunities, really, in the future to have more discussion with you. So if you have any interest, in knowing more about philanthropy in China. Um, our audiences can also download our China Issue Guide series and then um, engage in uh, discussion with us next time. So thank you to Madam Li, Madam Yu, and Madam Yuan. In the interest of time, I'll conclude this roundtable discussion. And I hope with our concerted efforts, we could have access to education for each and every one of China, Chinese people. Thank you. Thank you to Madame Gun and the three great roundtable panelists. Now I'd like to hand over to Vice Secretary General CDRF, Mr. Yu Jianduo, to moderate the second roundtable. Um, we'll focus on poverty alleviation philanthropy. And we have uh, Mr. Wang Jun, Vice Secretary General, China Foundation for Rural Development, Wei Wen, Vice President, Eve Group, and Zhen Xiong, Vice Secretary General, Guoqian Foundation, to join him. Thank you, Jingjing. Jing. Welcome to join us at the Philanthropy Roundtable Perspectives on Poverty Alleviation Philanthropy. In this roundtable, we will discuss on um, what can we do and how should we engage in rural revitalization? In the opening speech from Mr. Fang Jing, he said that by the end of 2020, China has uh, realized the historic poverty alleviation efforts moving and lifting almost a hundred million population out of poverty. And this is a monumental stage in China's and global poverty alleviation efforts. Now in the second stage of rural revitalization, um, this new stage is different from the past stage of poverty alleviation. In the standards were different. In the poverty alleviation, we have absolute poverty. We have the minimum um, requirement and now for rural revitalization, I think we have a longer uh, time frame with gradual changes taking place. So there will be multiple differences on the practices. We have three panelists who are frontline practitioner in poverty alleviation and rural revitalization. 
they have uh, directly impacted on thousands of people in poverty. And in many areas, they have created a beacon project. So my first question is, speaking of the two stages, poverty alleviation and rural revitalization, in your own foundation, in your own organization, what are some of the differences in your work? Now I'd like to hand over to Wang Jun, Vice Secretary General from China Foundation for Rural Development, about three minutes. Good afternoon. I am quite happy to be invited to join this conference. So what are the greatest differences? I think we need to shift from solving the absolute poverty to providing resources for people living in underdeveloped regions. Because in poverty affiliation, we have one support. Uh, we provide them worry-free for their food, house, and we provide them medical care. But now in rural revitalization, we shift our focus on education. For example, infrastructure building, dormitories, libraries building, and in rural revitalization, uh, the softwares must be equipped um, with the hardware's development. For example, teacher's training, uh, classroom improvement. So in the rural revitalization, we need to promote quality education. Second, in terms of the health and countryside health, in the past, poverty alleviation stage, we've supported in medical device and medical infrastructure. But now in the new stage of rural revitalization, we want to continue to enhance the capability of the countryside doctors, not only giving them good equipment like mobile medical device, but also improving their competence. Now we have initiated a project in 160 key counties, we cover all of the doctors in the program. And also we have a housing project. In the past, poverty alleviation, we built houses, but now we focus on hygiene. For example, the treatment of wastewater, the solid waste treatment. And now we also pay more attention to fairness and sustainability of the people living in rural areas. So it's from having no access to resources to providing better access to resources. Okay, now let's move on to Wei Wei from Eve Group. Good afternoon. My name is Wei Wei from Eve Group. Today we're talking about the poverty alleviation philanthropy. We have Eve China craftsmen and uh, embroidery workshop where we started the workshop in the last 18 years. We have built an enabling platform for the um, embroidery and um, people who embroider. Because we are a fashion group and we noted that for China's fashion industry to further bloom, we need some intrinsic cultural element. So about 18 years ago, we have a team who visited the people living in the mountains and villages to survey these craftsmen, for example, the Miao ethnic minority and Bai ethnic minority living in Yunnan. They really have excellent embroidery techniques, which cannot bring them economic value. So back then, we tried our best 
to create economic benefits out of these embroideries so that all these craftswomen could find a good way of life. So our president, Madame Xia said, for these embroidery women, we want to help them to stand on their own feet by making their own embroidery while feeding their baby. So in the last 18 years, we visited Xinjiang, Qinghai, Neimeng. We covered 30 ethnic minority groups in China. We built the only available traditional embroidery enabling platform. We have two database. The first database is over 18,000 embroidery women. And we put them in our database, including their name, their specialty, their particular technique. The second database is on the traditional Chinese embroidery pattern database. We have identified the ethnic minorities typical pattern from their garments. And then we put them into database as design sketch over 8,000 of patterns in the database now publicly available to over 1,600 designers worldwide. So the embroidery women are still doing what they do, but their embroideries now access to the consumer's wardrobe. So such a project is not only what we engage in our philanthropic costs, but also what we do day to day. Over 18 years of history, we have brought the best and finest Chinese embroidery to International Fashion Week to help their minority cultures bloom, but most importantly, um, enabling these great craftswomen to be able to benefit economically while providing for the family. So when we think about how to focus, I think our key philosophy is on how to create industrial economic value out of these traditional crafts. Each and every embroidery women are great craftswomen. And with one order, some women will be able to complete the order in two weeks or some even in two days. So in addition to making orders for them, we need to empower them to help them dig up their potential. So eventually, we stay true to our concept that by digitalization, by creating good IP, by creating a industrial cluster, we have been able to create economic value for the Chinese traditional embroidery craftswomen. Thank you to Weiwei. I know that uh, Guoqiang Foundation had uh, quite great an innovative practice in poverty alleviation. So the floor is now open to you, Mr. Zhengxiong. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, everyone at Guoqiang Foundation. We are a latecomer. We established ourselves in 2013, but uh, poverty alleviation work started in 1997. And in this poverty alleviation program, we are focusing on education, for the people and also other rural infrastructure programs. For poverty alleviation, we have scholarship. We have our own middle school. We also have country guard uh, vocational college. So we are building those schools to help the impoverished students to change their life with knowledge. And for precision alle poverty alleviation, we also send teams to local areas to help with the uh, industrialization 
working opportunities, and we are helping the locals for elevation of poverty. And it's more like an investment. And in the rural revitalization era, we want to have sustained operation. Like Chen Chong said in Guoqiang Foundation, we are investing into social enterprise. So they will be running with business terms, with social impact. So it's a commercial uh, philanthropic venture to solve problems in a sustainable way. And the Guoqiang Foundation is based on the country garden, a Fortune 500 company. And we have operating teams. We also have uh, uh, 2,000 communities as our sales channels. And we also have uh, partnerships. That means a lot of resources can be pulled together through business operation. They can be part of the operation. And we have established a number of ventures. For instance, Bixiang company is selling the agricultural produce. And we also have cultural ventures and we are exploring the way of uh, business operation for philanthropy, for rural uh, revitalization. So at the beginning, it's just the uh, uh, expenses, but uh, later on, it is becoming a sustainable operation. So we have heard from uh, the many foundations, and we've heard their different approaches in revitalization. For the Rural Development Foundation, we have a number of projects and a huge coverage. And we have a huge audience as well. We have established our social impact for years. And the Ewen Group has 18 years experience in one thing and one thing only. And they have digitalization, uh, commercialization of the product. And at the Guoqiang Foundation, they have also uh, uh, also uh, use this sustainable development method for philanthropy. And uh, in this era of uh, rural revitalization, sustainable philanthropy is going to be the focus. Business market-oriented means should be integrated with the philanthropy as a new paradigm. And I just don't want to ask you to share with us what is your uh, exploration in this journey, what are the most helpful things for the sustainable development? And what would be the challenges you have faced along the way? Uh, Mr. Wang Jun, please, you can start. That's a great topic. When we are trying to understand rural revitalization and poverty alleviation, there is a difference. In the poverty alleviation, it's mostly philanthropy. It's just a donation. But the revitalization is really about sustainable development. So there are different ways for philanthropy. Sustainable development is uh, going to be a very important paradigm. And our foundation, we are trying to explore business approaches to make sure those programs are sustainable. For the past 20 years, we have established the largest social uh, business in China called uh, Zhongke Mingxing. And uh, they are working in 60 counties of China. Uh, they provide uh, micro lendings to the uh, disadvantaged group. And in this new era, we are continuing this uh, exploration to make sure it's sustainable. Firstly, we are exploring, exploring the new social business approach, helping the uh, farmers. And uh, the farmers, when they are producing uh, agricultural produce, they have limited in information channel, they have limited capabilities in supply chain. Sometimes they cannot commercialize the business and it's very hard to arrive at the hand of the consumers. So we are working with the co-ops together so they can uh, work as a 
group of people and we are using different resources and to add a brand to their product that means with this brand that means uh, we are endorsing this product and with quality and then buying this product means you are doing something uh, philanthropic and that we are expanding from the counties to a larger base now that's one way to do it and secondly in addition to our own effort we are trying to establish impact uh, fund and working with many local governments now and uh, we're trying to establish a social uh, fund that will be invested into social businesses or projects and we are in the process of conversation with them and your question is about challenge later i think the challenge biggest challenge is about regulation and the awareness of the society for this model is not very good so far and secondly we need to work with experts so they can help the social business it's kind of an innovative measure and we need some uh, acknowledgement from the society and government thank you mr wong uh, when we talked about the uh their measures and explorations at eve group and they've been trying to build up some momentum so far maybe you can share with us how can you build up the scale and how can you overcome the challenges in the process sometimes the project is good when they are small but once you want to scale up there will be different challenges how did you handle those challenges okay thank you yes they, there are huge challenges because we are covering many provinces and in different markets and different re regions and there are and there are different characteristics especially when it comes to the ethnic minorities before 2018 we are also spending but to make it sustainable you must have a good business model and to find the best business model we want to be autism and we have a we have built up a marketized platform called uh, mountain marketplace it is a consumption model where in the business centers we provide uh, experience immersive platform for the consumers in all the mountain marketplace the products are coming from the elderly in the rural area they make it by their hands and then you sell it at the shopping malls in the bigger cities and secondly we are using the 8000 uh, copyrighted uh, product from the library and we are licensing to the uh, craftsmen for, for, in, for instance ms designers are using this a silver lock from miao ethnic minority for a scarf and and uh, we also have other international luxury brand working on the same kind of product and sometimes they use our pattern to create uh, innovative and creative uh, products on this platform the challenge is that the consumer need to pay for it and it's like uh, turning those crafts into a lifestyle it's not just a slogan of just uh, spending for philanthropic uh, uh, causes they are just buying a product and then we have mountain arts we have cultural uh, products furnitures uh, handcrafts and food for sustainable development model, the mountain marketplace must be differentiated from the shopping mall model. The embroiders from the mountain, they sometimes spend a month or two months in the shopping mall. And the kids from the city will talk to them and to really have a first-hand experience with those uh, craftsmanship. 
and we are breaking down this closed loop so people can buy the product online and offline when the purchase line is longer the more designers and more uh, craftsmen can be involved so this year we have more than 4000 SMEs and many embroiders joining this program and we are helping them to sell the product throughout the world. Very innovative. Uh, Mr. Zhong Xiong from Guoqiang, maybe you can share with us what is your exploration and what are the challenges along the way and how have you handled those challenges? I want to share with you an example. Under our foundation, we have an agriculture company called Yuxiang. It is our solution provider for re rural revitalization. And how can we take advantage of our strength to meet the new requirements for development? It's also re related to our core business. As a property development company, we need to handle with the government relations. And as a company in Guangdong, we are helping a province called Guizhou, and we are helping another city called Maoming in Guangdong province. These are some of the uh, options for us, and once we have identified them, we will do market survey. In Guizhou, uh, southeast Guizhou, we have a uh, project of a fish and we have support from the government funds and we are also uh, putting our fund into it and we have uh, uh, public funds we have also uh, social investment and investing into this uh, circular uh, fishing project and in this project and we are doing investigations based on the endowment of the local place and we are doing planning based on local endowments and uh, we have selected the point the project and we planned for it now we are building up the supply chain and it's a highly strategic approach with market in mind trying to provide revitalization to the rural area. And the biggest challenge is, there are two challenges actually. First is on the supply side, then it's also on the demand side. On the supply side, we want to pull the local resources. And the, for instance, the uh, uh, fishery project of SC Pensa, we are helping them to uh, culture the fish and we provide tech skills and we provide uh, the capabilities for deep processing of the fish. And we are also trying to find the market uh, through our own channels and through online channels as well. We are also providing R&D services trying to use technology based on our cooperation with Tsinghua University, and we can extract some anti-aging uh, protein from the fish. So we can build and design more projects and products. All these efforts are relying on talents, which is in sh shortage so far, and for all those revitalization projects, I think uh, talent is the first priority. And secondly, and the, the like the other speaker also alluded earlier, as a social business, many of the social businesses enterprises are not appreciated by the society or the government. And the this business model has not been approved by the government. Sometimes the community are not uh, uh, appreciating this way of doing business. 
and sometimes we get negative feedbacks. And however, that, those are all the challenges we have to deal with and the technology capabilities, talents, market. These are the challenges we are trying to uh, sort out. Thank you. Thank you to three panelists for the in-depth sharing. And um, we can continue to engage in our roundtable for another 10 minutes. So now I'd like to dig up further to three panelists. You've all talked about the challenges you face in your innovative philanthropic projects. Some involves the support and recognition from the government. Some challenges are in relation to talents and resources. So on one hand, like Madame Wenwei said, you need to utilize the traditional patterns, but then it involves the protection of these IPs. So a, a project is multifaceted and just not long time ago, we have a global luxury brand which copied a traditional Chinese um, ethnic minority pattern, which aroused great controversy globally. I think as we develop, there will be more IP cases like that. So speaking the projects at large, I think all of you are now moving closely with the government's guidance. If let's say, there's a chance for you to ask the government for more policy support, what would that be? What are the top three ideas in your mind? Over to you, Mr. Wang. Three policy suggestions, okay. For social organizations, I think we exist because we want to solve social challenges and problems. We see very sufficient social resources. We're never short of social resources, but we are short of good solutions. So in short, when we solve the social challenges, we believe the government should offer more room for the social delivery organizations. And of course, over the last few years, we see the government has regulated the um, social delivery organizations, but with that regulation, um, there are undoubtedly some pressure. So I would love for the government to loosen up a little bit. That's all for me, okay? Mr. Zhen. Well, there are a great, great amount of suggestions I could give to the government, but recently um, I've advocated for government to certify SG, um, social delivery organizations and social enterprises. Secondly, I think um, we should leverage the media to promote um, business for good practice. For example, the practice from Eve Group. We would love for more people to um, hear the good practices. So we want to encourage the government to intensify um, the promotion of these projects. Number three, I would love for the government to offer some um, good governance and uh, policy support because there are some social enterprises which have encountered some difficulties in their associated um, capital transaction or um, commercial endeavors. So I think if the government can roll out more and uh, well-regulated uh, policy as a guidance, then that will ensure more and wider access to philanthropy from the social delivery organizations. 
I heard from Mr. Zeng and I echo with what he said. He talked about Taijing County, which is a region where we have the most number of embroidery ladies in the past and lady there embroider for their own family members, but now they can create um, embroideries that uh, really generate up to 800,000 um, RMB economic value. So for Eve Group, we really would love for the government to um, provide us support to work with other businesses. Secondly, as you said, there are IPs because the embroidery and patterns were derived from the local regions and it involves much efforts to digitize them and uh, revise them. So we heavily want to have the government support in having more volunteers to support us with the patterns collection efforts. Thank you. Just now we have three great panelists giving their insight and proposing their innovative project, especially on social impact investment on their innovative practice. Of course, in the process of innovation, we have difficulties here and there. For example, the uh, certification or to social enterprises, some problems in the capital market and uh, some IP related issues, um, you know, and there is a scale issue. When we scale up, sometimes we have a glass ceiling that uh, hinders the development of a project. In my organization, we actually have been researching on social impact investment and social impact. I think for the certification of social enterprise is now um, a demand for many, many players in this uh, philanthropic cause. And for example, we noted that uh, some local governments are now uh, introducing good policies, for example, hosting the charity and philanthropy exhibition. So in the future, we look forward to more synergies with one another, where we engage with one another, we communicate with one another, we could then have uh, voices being heard by the government for sustainable growth. Thank you to our three speakers for the great sharing. And that wrap up our panel and roundtable discussion. Let me hand over back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Yu, and thank you to all speakers. And I'm sure you all find it very fruitful. Now I'd like to give the floor to Madame Rui Xihao, Senior Program Officer from Bill Melinda Gates Foundation for concluding remarks. Thank you to the moderator. I hope you all hear me. Thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you. I am very happy that today, on behalf of Bell Melinda Gates Foundation, um, I'm joining this conference once again. My name is Rishi Hao. I'm a senior program officer. Um, I'd like to thank the host, CAPS, as well as CDRF for hosting this conference. Just now, Dr. Ruth Shapiral told me we have more than 300,000 people um, watching our live stream online, which showcase the wide engagement from the general public to philanthropy. So thank you to our speakers today. The team that I work with is the team for philanthropic collaboration. The goal for us is to support the philanthropy development. In China, philanthropy and charity definitely play a very important role in eradicating absolute poverty and providing social support. You can see the philanthropic donations 
in the last 10 years has doubled, reaching 225.3 billion RMB, among which we see enterprise donations and small scale donations from the general public all increased dramatically. However, in the last few years, the worsening of global income and wealth inequality, the outbreak of COVID had slowed down and even reversed the progress we have secured. And that means we need to reflect upon on the following issues. For example, what are the unique role and value of philanthropic organizations or social delivery organizations versus private sector, civil sector, and government bodies? Second, how should we select to maximize the impact of philanthropy given limited resources? Or how do we evaluate and assess the performance of our projects and our organization? With these issues, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation and UBS team have supported CAPS for their evidence-based research on private social investment and its role in health, environment, education, and poverty alleviation. As in today's lunch, you noted our extensive research and deep insights over the last two years. It is a collection of public wisdom. These four series of China issue guide will be of great reference for our readers to improve quantity and quality of philanthropy in China. Today, we issue two China issue guides, one on education philanthropy, the other on poverty alleviation. In the report on poverty alleviation, Mr. Yu Jiantuo have dived deeply into over last seven decades of history, analyzed that in last four decades, China has eradicated China's 765 million population in poverty to zero. And this, of course, is not possible without government support efforts, but also the social enterprises and all SDOs in the afternoon, we heard from all these Eve group, Guoqiang Foundation, and um, the University Foundation. We noted the important role played by all these players that through the enterprise individual and government collaboration, East-West collaboration, industrial poverty alleviation, employment support, infrastructure building, educational support, health support, support to the elderly. Chinese practitioners in philanthropy have created localized and innovative best practice. And in the future, in the new era of rural revitalization, we hope that philanthropy can be deeply rooted in China's local regions to create new significant contributions, for example, on improving digital competence and social governance. Education is a vital part of China's traditional value. And thank you to Professor Wang Rong Wei Yi from Peking University, as well as Director Zhang Li from Education Development Research Center of Ministry of Education. In the report on education philanthropy, CAPS have analyzed on China's efforts in promoting educational fairness and higher quality education. In China, we want to realize the modernization of China's education 2035 goal. In today's sharing, we also noted various best practices. For example, donors setting up scholarships, donations to top universities, teachers training programs, and infrastructure building. All these efforts not only sustained the care to our students, to our faculty members, to the schools, but also some innovative project on holistic education, quality education covering sports, music, art, reading, early education, and vocational education, even special education, all developing full swing. And I'm sure that education and philanthropy is not only about national educational modernization, rural revitalization, but also 
underscores the love, wisdom, and persistence of all the frontline workers. Philanthropy knows no boundary. We as humans are born to love and care. We see that the love and care from the capable individuals and businesses are there to shoulder greater social responsibility. Philanthropy is deeply rooted in Chinese culture. As China embarks on the road to modernization, philanthropy will continue to prosper with Chinese characteristics. In our cases, the value of philanthropy is not only about supporting the poor out of poverty, saving others' lives, but we see systematic reflection from China's practitioners on sustainable solution. We often say that philanthropy plays the role of a catalyst, and that is so true because as catalyst, philanthropy synergizes the private and public department. It collects multi-faced wisdom and impact. That's what in today's philanthropy roundtable on education, which all the speakers talk about synergy and collaboration. And that's the intention behind our China Issue Guide series, to have more people engage in our philanthropy cause in China to maximize the impact of private social investment. Lastly, I'd like to say thank you to CAPS, Dr. Ruth Shaperol, Chairman Ronnie Chen, CDRF, Secretary General Fang Jing, UBS team, and our particularly experts who have committed in the report, Harvard School of Public Health Professor Winnie Yip, Ma Jun, Director on the Institute of Public Environmental Affairs and Environment, Professor Wang Rong Wei Yi of Peking University, and Zhang Li, former Director of Education Development Research Ministry of Education. And thank you to all the distinguished guests, industrial leaders, and the practitioners. We look forward to sharing with all of you for greater engagement to respond to the unmet needs to innovate boldly together to write a new chapter in China's private social investment history. Thank you once again for your engagement and I congratulate on the success of today's conference. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you to Madame Rui Xi Hao for that great conclusion. Dear friends, that wrap up today's China Philanthropy Conference Education and Poverty Alleviation Launch of China Issue Guide Series. Thank you to all the speakers today and thank you to our audiences joining us online and look forward to seeing you in our future activities and conferences. And please scan the QR code to access to today's China Issue to Guides and look forward to seeing you in the future.